Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. Are you ready for the Word? Today I want to speak about liberty in Jesus. Before we get there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The New Living Translation says, Fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. Bump your neighbor. Tell your neighbor there's great treasure inside of you. Amen. And tell your neighbor, and there's great treasure inside of me. Tell your neighbor, don't take me for granted. <laughs> yep. You hearing me? There's great treasure on the inside of each and every one of us. He says that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So what he's saying, the treasure is on the inside, but the vessel is fragile. And therefore we need God. And that's why the treasure will come forth that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, I want us to look at verse 8. It says there that we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Bump your neighbor and say, that's me, baby. That's me. That's me. So with the earthen vessel that we're in, and I want to encourage you here today, that is fragile. Yet he is saying that we are hard pressed with troubles from every side. You look to the one side, there's troubles. Other side, there's troubles. You look all over, there's troubles. He says, but although the troubles are coming from every side, the Bible says, yet not crushed, yet not pulverized, yet not over, yet not done. Come on, somebody. Not confined. So I, I, I'm pressed from every side, but not confined, not crushed, not broken, not restricted. Are you hearing me yet? He says that we are perplexed. Perplexed means filled with uncertainty. Means I don't actually see the light at the end of the tunnel. And somebody says, it's the light at the end. You say, what light? <laughs> you don't see a way out. You don't see a way through. So you're at the place of uncertainty within your life, but the Bible says, yet you are not in despair. In other words, you're not crippled with fear and anxiety and worry. He says you are persecuted, which means you're hunted down. which means there's an organizing systemic continual harassment intentional on purpose persecuted but not forsaken not abandoned by God not left uncared for you struck down a blow that causes pain, suffering as you've been knocked 
down, but although you've been struck down, the Bible says you're not destroyed. You're on the canvas, but you can't be counted out. You're lying there and the devil's waiting for the ref to go one, two, three, but he's standing there and he can't and the devil's going to say, hey. And everybody around you says, he's out. He's finished, it's over, it's done. Struck down. But you see, he's not struck down, why? Because God says, my hand will uphold you. My hand will keep you. The shoulder is not on the canvas. Why? Because the hand of God is between the canvas and between your shoulders and you cannot be counted out because God is in control of your life. Say with me, I'm hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. I am perplexed, but not in despair. Say with me, I'm persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Say with me, I have a treasure on the inside of me. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. So we have this fragile vessel, which we read in Galatians chapter five, verse one, where it says, now stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So that we stand fast. Okay, so, so once again, it brings me to the priest. You're hard pressed, there's troubles on every side. Hey, you're not crushed. Hey. Dump your neighbor. Say, you're not crushed. <laughs> so when somebody comes and says, oh, I've got troubles, then what do you say? You're not crushed. When you come and you're sure, not, and you're unsure. Say, oh, I, 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 I'm unsure. I'm perplexed. Yeah, you're not, you're not in despair. God is in control. And that's why we stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. You are free from your troubles, even though they come from every side. Can I get a big amen there? You have a treasure on the inside. Can I get a big amen there? So now stand fast in that liberty Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So you are free, but don't allow fear to control your life. Don't allow panic to control your life. Don't allow sin to control your life. Do not get into that place once again where you are yoked. John 8, 36 says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. When Jesus sets you free, you are free. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. Therefore, I want to take a few weeks and we're going to be speaking about liberty that we have in Christ. Amen. There's certain things that take and steal your liberty. Now, today I want to speak about, maybe next week, I want to speak on Proverbs 22, verse 7, where it says that the borrower is the servant to the lender. The rich rules over the poor. You are not free if you're in debt. Now, you know, I never preach on money. But once or twice a year, I just remind you. Jesus spoke more on the subject of money than any other subject except for love. Because of the potential bondage it has. That people get, see, people get, there's two things people get itchy about in church. Is when you talk about money, why? Because they're slaves to money. 
If you get uncomfortable when you mention money, that means money is your God. Okay? Uncomfortable when somebody has it, you don't have it. Somebody, are, are you hearing me? Look, whatever, ever, whatever form that it bothers you, hello, slave. Are you hearing me? And that's why we have to see what the Bible says about this. The other thing is when you give an altar call for people to get saved. People get uneasy about that. Because it's the two places that are critical in a person's life. So, out of control finances is a symptom of an out of control life. Bump your neighbor and say, are you out of control? It's time to make Jesus the CEO and CFO of your, of your life. The root of most financial problems is a lack of faith, which equals a poverty mindset. There's wealthy people that have, that have got poverty mentality. See, when you live in a maintenance mode, trying to hang on to what you have, self-preservation is a poverty mentality. Maintaining what you have is a poverty mentality. And it comes from a lack of faith. The source of faith is Christ. Where is my trust? Where is my faith? Where is my security? Because if your decisions are based on finances, that means you're a slave to finances rather than to the purpose that God has placed upon your life. That means it controls your marriage. It controls your relationships. It controls where you live. Come on, somebody. It controls where you go. It controls what you achieve. That's why Job 31 verse 24, in the New Living Translation, it says, have I put my trust in money or felt secure because of my gold? This is Job. Have I gloated about my wealth and all that I own? Then he says in verse eight, he says, if so, I should be punished by the judges. For it would mean that I have denied the God of heaven. If you think getting that promotion brings you security, you're going to be in for a big surprise. And for those that have got promotions, you know exactly. Yeah, so yeah I know exactly what you're saying. See, for it would mean I've denied. We need to settle the issue of trust once and for all. Are we going to trust God to take care of us? Well, then we need to handle what we have received according to the word. Say me the word. word. See, God is an investor. God is a sower. God is a builder. Are you hearing me? Proverbs 11 verse 24. It says, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than what is right, but that leads to poverty. Let me read the New Living Translation. It says, give freely and become more wealthy, be stingy and lose everything. Bump your neighbor say, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose everything. <laughs> That's why he says, to those who have, more will be given. To those who don't have, they're going to even lose what you have. That's what I've learned in my life. Whenever I'm at a place where I'm under pressure in my finances, it's the time I give the most. As a church, that's when we sow the most. As you know, 3C is a very generous ministry. We support other churches. We support other churches' building programs. We, have, we, we sow into the, into the country. We sow our finances into the poor. 
And then God supplies. So, so you can have a poverty mindset within your life where you maintain what you have. But God is a builder. Say to me, God's a builder. So how do you build? How do you, it's by investing. Investing your time, investing your effort, investing your finances. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 30. It says, I walk by the field. The first thing we've got to understand, the poverty mindset. He says, I walk by the field of a lazy person. The vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown. Just look down the row and see whose house we're talking about, whose grass is not cut, whose garden is not done. It's getting quiet in this church, hallelujah. <laughs> it was covered with weeds. The wall was broken down. This is the field of a lazy person. This is the field of a lazy person. This is the field of a lazy person. This is the field of a What about the pavement? Isn't that the municipality's responsibility? It's your pavement front of your house. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. Cut the grass, clean it. What about the street? Belongs to the municipality. Get a broom, sweep the street. Hello. Bump your neighbor and say, are you one of them lazy people? <laughs> huh? Huh? Are you that one that Pastor Bird's speaking about now? See, that's a poverty mentality. This whole pavement that's kept you up here by the road, right up now, Marpius and everything, that's not the municipality that cleans that, by the way. We, the church maintains this whole street. We maintain the whole now, Marpius. All those banisters that are painted there right up to the stop street and everything that's there, we do that as a church. That's not the municipality. Okay. We start here at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Everything is clean. Are you hearing me yet today? So once again, it's about work. He says, then as I looked and I thought about it, I learned a lesson, a little extra sleep, a little bit more slumber, a little folding of the hands. A little extra sleep, a little extra sleep. Oh, I can't, I'm tired. I work so hard, I need to sleep. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Because you didn't cut your grass. It's the mindset. It's not my job. It's like people that stay in someone's property, they rent the property and they don't upkeep it. If you can't look after something that which is someone else's, God will never entrust you with your own. Yeah. Poverty will jump on, upon you like a bandit. You're going to stay poor. You, you're always going to rent for the rest of your life. If you don't look after it as if it's yours. You borrow somebody's machine, you give it back worse than what it was. Borrow somebody's car, you give it back empty, no, no gas. Petrol. Take someone's car, 
Give it back dirty. If you borrow something from somebody, see, that's a mentality. You take it and you borrow somebody, then you take it. You make sure that it's cleaner than it was. You don't give it back dirty. You understand? If you use their lawnmower and you use their cutter or whatever, or their spade or whatever, when you are finished, you take that spade and you wash that spade like it's brand new and spray it if it's necessary, you understand. But be thankful that you're able to use it and you give it back in a better condition than what you had it. And you borrowed somebody's car, you give it back with a full tank of petrol. Bandit. You're going to stay poor, my friend. You're going to stay poor because you're a taker. You're a taker. You've got a poverty mentality. You're going to stay poor because all you do is take, use for yourself, take, 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 take. I'm, even, I'm talking about even the kids when it comes to their parents. Yeah, and some of you are 40. You're still staying with mommy. When I did the first verse, none of you thought we were going down this direction. You thought, oh, some grace this morning. Are you hearing me? It's a poverty mentality. Listen to me. You're going to stay poor and you will never have. You'll never have. If you're a taker and a schemer and a hustler, always trying to get what you can and always want a discount, always trying to get what you, you know, always trying to hustle, 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 hustle. I don't mind paying more so I can bless the person because they're working. And I can. So if you've got a mentality like that, when I pay for something, I'm seeing it as an investment in the person that I'm paying. I don't see it as I'm, I'm just, I scored, eh? Yes, I, I scored, eh? I, I, I should have paid 200 and I only paid 50. <laughs> stupid. Poverty mentality, stupid. No, when I pay more for something, what have I done? I've invested within an individual and just the trust and the goodwill that I get from that person is more than the stupid 50 rand that I saved. You see, it's stupid people that think like that. Poverty people. And guess what? With that type of thinking, you'll stay poor. And you will rent and you'll always be in debt. Poverty mentality, why? You don't have faith in God. Why don't you have faith that you'll be able to pay the full price? Why don't you have faith that you'll have enough money to pay? Isn't that better? Now, I know there's some of you that were born negotiating. Hallelujah. <laughs> It's like in your blood. It's part of the DNA, you understand? It's like, sure. Nothing wrong with negotiating. Okay, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's nothing wrong with negotiating, getting a better price and things like that. That's not the issue and making sure you're not being hustled yourself. Nothing wrong with that but I'm talking about a poverty mentality where you're a taker all the time. You take, take, take. Are you hearing me? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23 says, in all labor there is profit. Not just financial profit. Listen to me. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. There's talkers and there's doers. Work brings profit, the New Living Translation, but mere talk 
leads to poverty. There's always people that are going to, going to, going to, going to, going to, one day going to, I'm this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. People like that, poverty mentality. Get up now. Do now. What are you doing now? No, tomorrow. No, and what about today? Get up out of bed, brush your teeth, put on some clothes, and go work. Being unemployed is never a reason not to work. Yes. While I'm unemployed, unemployment and work is, is ir, it's not related. You can work without being employed. But if you don't work, you're going to stay poor. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, you don't have a job, but you've got to work. So you get up the same time as your family. You might be unemployed. You might have lost your job. And with the circumstances and things, I understand we're not being judgmental, but then you get up the same time as the family and then you do the work. You clean the house, you fix up everything, you do the garden, make sure everything is out. And then you go out, you look for a job and if you can't find a job, then you volunteer somewhere, but you work. At the end of the day, who's the boss? He's the boss. And if you're lying around, listen to me, waiting for a job, poverty will bounce and jump on you like a bandit. I emailed, my, my, I emailed my CV to 200 people. Serious, you emailed your CV? That's what you did? From your bed, from your computer? Seaspun. <laughs> Get up out of your bed. Go work. Go work. Seaspun. If you're a Christian, God will help you. Here's the thing. When you work, you'll get employed. Every employer knows you don't employ unemployed people. Or let me put it this way. You don't employ people that don't work. You employ people that work. The first thing they want to do. Oh, I've been unemployed for so long, so long. They don't. Companies don't employ people that don't work. They employ people that work. So are oh, you volunteering somewhere? What are you doing? But you can't sit around and do nothing and hope for the best. At the end of the day, it's God that opens the door and closes the doors. Can I get a big amen there? And you can sit around, lie at home, feel sorry for yourself. Guess what? Poverty will bounce, jump on you like a bandit. Labor, said me labor. And it says labor, in all labor there is profit, not just financial profit. See, if you're always looking for financial profit, that's a poverty mentality. Because then you're a slave. It's not about financial profit. It's about goodwill. It's about trust. Greatest equity is not finances. The greatest equity is trust. When people trust you, when people believe in you. So that's what you're looking for, where there is labor at profits, where you are working. People say, ha, ah, ah, I can trust you. Look, what the, and what are they doing? Oh, no. Hey, I'll work for you for free. Can I, hey, my time, can I work for you for free? Yeah, yeah, no, sure, come work. After a few months, they say, uh-oh, we better employ this person. We don't want to lose them. <laughs> trust is built. Is this helping somebody? So you don't have a job, go volunteer, go work at a company, go say, I'll, I'll work for free and start there and start adding value. Start showing them why they need to pay you. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. Okay. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God says, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So never be unthankful for what you have. Always be thankful. Because we always want more. Be thankful. Don't love money. So within the framework of where we find ourselves, and I'm rushing with time. I don't have a lot of time. Debt will 
kill you. And everything in the world is geared towards getting you to owe money. It's not the selling of the product at the stores where they make the money. That's where you buy it on credit is where they actually make the money. Are you hearing me? It's called unsecured debt. So credit cards, any type of furniture cards, any type of cards that you pay. When you are now in debt, while I must just have those, bump your neighbor and say, you must nothing. You must nothing. I must have those. No, I deserve, I deserve a holiday. Then how you pay for the holiday? On your credit card. And December is coming up. Come on, somebody. I must, I must buy presents. I must this and I must that. And it's joyous occasion and we must, we must. Bump your neighbor and say, you must nothing. You must nothing. Everything's a decision on whether you want to be poor, whether there is self-control, or whether you're going to go into debt. No accounts for anything. Clothing accounts, close them. Credit cards accounts, cut up those cards. Can I get a big amen there? If you cannot pay your credit card in full at the end of the month, you are not a responsible credit card user. That credit card is your prison. Hello. And they give it out. No furniture. No furniture accounts. I must have, you must nothing. Well, I don't have a sofa. Well, buy pillows. <laughs> I mean, in the East, they just sit on the floor on pillows. Why can't you do that? Why must you have the sofa? Why must you? Bump your neighbor and say, you must nothing. You must nothing. To impress who? Who do you want to impress? Are, are you hearing me here today? If you can't, if you don't have the money to buy it, you don't buy it. So no clothing accounts. No clothing accounts. Because the interest rates that they pay there, no furniture accounts. He's not your uncle in the furniture business. He's not your uncle. He's not. You buy that couch and take six months or a year or four years to pay off that stupid couch and the couch is bust and broken and thrown out and you're still paying off that couch. Can I get a big amen there? And I don't know if you've seen on the cards. They say thank you. <laughs> they are extremely thankful. They are so thankful. They put it on the card there. They say thank you. Why? Because they're busy flying over those jets you see flying over here. you paying for that fuel. You're paying for it. And you don't have a car. But, but, but hang on. But at least you have that pair of jeans with a bunch of holes in it. You understand? I mean, at least you have that. Your knees are sticking out. The more holes they have, the more expensive the jeans are. And you know what it was? It was just some dude sitting in a ballroom and say, hey, we've got all these jeans full of holes. What are we going to do with it? Oh, no, just slap an extra thousand bucks on those jeans and let's see if they sell. And guess what? They're selling. <laughs> but don't worry. You can't afford them. No, people can't afford them. No, then we give them a card. And all we have to do is say thank you. When we say thank you, people don't mind. Now you've got jeans with the holes, but you don't have a car, you don't have a place to stay. Can I get a big amen? <laughs> Unsecured debt. You've got to consolidate that stuff. I'll speak about that next week, how to get out of debt. Who wants to know how to get out of debt? 
okay? I'll, I'll speak about that next week. Is that okay? It's not God's will that you're being dead. Amen? So therefore, I want to encourage us. You need to be set free from this I must have it now mentality. I must have it and I must have it now, that mentality, and understand, no. God wants you to be free. God wants you to accumulate wealth. But if there's holes in your bucket, it doesn't matter how much God gives you, it's just going to fall through the holes. So you've got to deal with the holes first. Bump your neighbor and say, plug them holes. Are you hearing me? Then I'm not even talking about going to get loans from these um, weird places. I'm not even talking about that. And then I'm not even talking about the micro-loaning business. I'll talk more about that evil next week. <laughs> Run by people that we now deem is, you know, we deem and we say, wow, that's awesome. They're great business people. No. I'm not going to give my mind now, right? Hallelujah. No, no. It's not. It's not. They'll be standing before God one day for how they have indebted people. Are you hearing me here today? So they'll stand before God one day. They'll stand before God one day. And you're asking 20%, 30% interest, stuff like that. That's not God's will. Anyway. So, so have me done with debt. So I want to encourage you. And that's why I spoke after offering. I don't, I, 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 when I'm speaking about the money, I don't want you to think that we're doing it so we can get money into the church. I want it so that you can be free. Money is a big deal. You understand? But if money is your God, you'll never be free. And he says, we've got to stand fast in the liberty that Christ has given us. There is a way that we need to handle our finances. There's a way that we need to do. You understand? And that's why with the Bible, he teaches us to tithe. So it means tithe. You understand? Once again, why? He teaches you how to walk in generosity where there's things you don't have control over. And I'll speak more about that next week. But we've got to get to that place where we trust the Lord and say, Lord, what must I do? How do I do it? How do I conquer in my finances? The first thing is get rid of, get rid of debt. The only debt you can have that is good debt is debt on property. Even a debt with a car is not good debt unless you're using the vehicle for work purposes and you're generating funds and you're generating work through the vehicle. But even a vehicle can destroy you. Are you hearing me? Yes. So therefore, we've got to look at these things. We need to deal with these things within our life and we need to consolidate our time, consolidate our debt, consolidate our finances. Come, and I want to encourage us. Number one, make sure... You keep good records. So that means good records. And I'm, I'm going to give the headings. I don't have time to speak about this. Number one, keep good records. Accounting. You've got to know some stuff. You not knowing doesn't take the problem away. Can I get a big amen? Bumpy and David said, I told you. I told you. You've got to know. I told you. Okay. Nothing in the dark. And then two is better than one. You and your wife, you and your spouse sit down and work through the stuff together. Can I get a big amen there? And say, well, accounting is not my, hey, you're not stupid. And I say, oh, accounting is not my thing. No, that's an excuse. You've got to know what the condition is of where you find yourself that you can know why you can't afford what you, need, you want to buy. Can I get a big amen there? So keep good records. Number two, say plan your spending, budgeting. So number one, accounting. Your personal finance. I'm not talking business. Personal finances. Secondly, budget. Stick to your budget. Proverbs 21 verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those who are hasty, sure, surely to poverty. And this is a sales technique. You've got to do it now. Because tomorrow it's gone. If anybody just speaks like that, you immediately decide, I'm not buying it. Okay, so that hook, that bondage, that's never God. That's never. Well, it's an opportunity. If you don't do it, you can save. Well, you know what? You save 500 rand. Yes, but you pay 500 rand to save the 500 rand. 
Are you hearing me? So whenever you're cornered and you must, and you must do it now, that's hasty. That's not God. Then you say, okay, you know what? I'll wait. I'll trust the Lord that in two months' time that I'll have the money to pay it. I'll pay a thousand rand for it. If it's God and he wants me to have it, I'll be able to pay a thousand rand for it, not 500. Does that make sense? Okay. Number three, save for the future. Save me, save. You've got to save. Save 10% every month. Start on it now. Start saving. Put 10% away. Put it in a savings account. You want to start investing. Save me, save. save. Number four, tithe. Let me tithe. And most, 99% of people that have wealth, these are the two principles. They save 10%. This is a, these are principles. They save 10% and they tithe 10%. Tithe 10%. Give 10% back to the Lord. Bring the tithes unto the storehouse. Why? Because everything you have, the ability comes from the Lord. So there has also always has to be generosity, sowing, so we can sow into other people. And I'll speak more about that another time. And then lastly, number five, enjoy what you have. Don't cry about what you don't have. Enjoy what you have. Be grateful for what you have. Look what you have. Even if you're renting what you have, look after it. Appreciate what you have. Appreciate the job you have. If you appreciate the job you have, God will give you another job. You understand? If you're thankful for what you have, thankful for the job you have, if you're always unhappy, Ecclesiastes 6 verse 9 in NLT says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless like chasing the wind. So this is how God blesses. Say it with me. Number one, say earn it. Amen. Number two, say tithe it. Number three, save it. Number four, repay it. Number five, enjoy it. Amen. Are you blessed? Is this helping you? Save me, I'm done with debt. Say, I'm done with debt. Say, me, I'm finished with this stuff. Amen. You still love me? Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Next week, I'll speak about it again and get into more detail, more practical. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift up your hands, Dick, where you are. Say to me, Heavenly Father, please forgive me where I have been undisciplined. Please forgive me for having a poverty mentality. I trust you, Lord. My life, my finances, provision, I trust you, Lord. You will take care of me. You will lead me. You will guide me. As your word says, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. And Lord, where I have failed you, being disobedient in my tithing and my offerings and my giving, having a poverty mentality, please forgive me, Lord make a decision now to trust you and to honor you in everything that I am and I know you are in control in Jesus name amen and amen and amen hallelujah amen thank you Jesus every head bowed every eye closed maybe there's somebody here you've not yet given your life to Jesus we're going to start with that today before we baptize God loves you so very much. He cares for you. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. The Bible says you must be born again. To be a child of God, you must be born of God. What does that mean? It means I'm done with my old life. I'm finished. I turn to God. He comes and He changes you. He does a miracle within your life. Forgives your sin and cleanses you. Makes you His child. And if there's somebody here today, you want to come to the Lord and maybe you've never done it before. Maybe you have. You're backslidden and you want to come back to the Lord. If that's you, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, quickly slip up your hand. One, two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see those hands, thank you. You can put it down, thank you very much. I wanna ask one more thing. If you raise your hands, 
I want to do a personal prayer with you. And I wonder if you raise your hands, if you can quickly grab your belongings. Don't leave it on the chair. Quickly come forward and I'm going to pray with you. Come on, church, give me a great hand. There is power in the blood of Jesus. stand a little bit forward those that are getting baptized those that are getting baptized won't you get grab your bags just quickly come forward I want to pray with you everyone that's been baptized Between the two weekends, we're going to be baptizing over a thousand people, by the way. So we are thankful, thankful to the Lord. We're so excited with the decision that you've made. Those that are getting baptized, we're excited with you. Just close your eyes and I want to pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for those that have now decided to go through the waters, to lay down their lives as they're baptized in the death. They raise up in the resurrection of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've placed purpose within them, Lord. You've called them as world changers, history makers, and we're excited as they publicly declare their faith today. Their lives will never be the same again. You protect them, keep them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And amen. This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, Call us on 86 or log on to my3c.tv. Or you could write to us at P.O. Box 10508 Centurion 0046 or email us at tv at my3c.tv. If you need prayer, SMS the word PRAY followed by your prayer request to 33347 and our team of prayer warriors will pray for you for 30 days. If you would like to become a partner with the ministry, SMS the word PARTNER to 33347 and one of our team members will get back to you within the next few days. You can follow Pastors Bert and Shane Pretorius on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to be inspired daily by morning devotions, ministry updates and much, much more. Log on to my3c.tv for more information.